Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is launching a successful 3PL in the age of tech with Nick Reisner and Jeff D'Angelo. Welcome, Jeff. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. That was Jeff. Thank you. And that was Nick. (laughs) Nick, please introduce yourself. My name is Nick Reisner. I'm the CEO of Transloop. I grew up in Oakwood in Dayton, Ohio, which is not too far from Cincinnati. I spent about eight years leading a logistics company in the sales aspect, entered the technology space, and here I am putting Transloop out there to the world. Nice. So you grew up in Cincinnati. Where'd you go to school? I grew up in Oakwood, which is in Dayton, Ohio, about 45 minutes away from Cincinnati. After high school at Oakwood, I did go to the University of Cincinnati. So what'd you study there? I was actually a lost sales guy. I tried to start many different businesses throughout college, which was not a degree. And then I found my path to communications and public relations, which had nothing to do with what I would ever accomplish in life. Well, communication is important in our biz. So tell us a little bit about your career highlights. Yeah. So I interned at one of the larger 3PLs during college, I would say. And then right out of college, I saw the opportunity to make some serious money and grow my career. So I joined that third-party logistics company right out of college. Right away, I saw quick success due to my work ethic. I saw that I could really make an impact within this company. I took advantage of it. Essentially, I was promoted on a yearly basis and then was asked to open a few different offices. I would say some highlights was growing offices from 0 to 25 within a year span and really making an impact within the organization. We went from opening one office in Chicago to 59 other offices throughout the country. And I felt like I had a major impact within all of that. So you told me when we were prepping for this that you also ended up leaving and getting more on the tech side. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I had a fortunate opportunity to join one of the top track and trace companies out there, which they also provide analytics. I was very fortunate to be brought on. Most technology companies do not bring on guys that come out of third-party logistics companies. I think partially that's due to their thought process of thinking that third-party logistics broker is most likely just pounding the phones with zero innovation in mind. My mindset all along was to sell our technology when I was at the 3PL, but I learned that shippers didn't care too much about a portal and logging on to maybe get an update that's inaccurate. (laughs) So when I was brought on by... You can say four kites, they won't mind. (laughs) You know, sometimes I just want to shy away from it, but no, four kites, and I was very proud to work there, so I don't know why I didn't mention that. (laughs) So four kites brought me on to sell their platform into shippers. We focused on Fortune 500 shippers and essentially the terminology and everything I learned at Forkites was half the reason I believe that we're so successful at Transloop is because I was able to dissect shippers' issues with their carriers. And the issue was transparency and shippers not being able to be able to track their drivers in real time and get analytics on the back end of why drivers are late or how long they're at shippers or receivers. So being at Forkites was a huge reason, I believe, for the success we've had at Transloop because we've been able to incorporate a lot of the verbiage along with processes that we have here. So very fortunate to be at both companies in the past. He's definitely got a different view. So Jeff, let's catch you up here. So where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Tell us a little bit of career highlights before you founded Turbo. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So the funny thing is I actually am born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I am literally sitting five minutes from where Nick Reasoner sort of lived during his college days and when he worked at TQL, I think back in the day. And the thing is, as Nick was talking, the funny thing is I was at TQL back in 2002. So I started my career in logistics about 18 years ago. I was probably the founder of, I would say, the internship program. So the internship program that he he worked in was the thing that I actually put together at TQL, which is kind of funny. I didn't know that until he just said that. You know, I spent six and a half years at TQL. So I started there when we were around $30 million in sales and then, you know, saw the run to about 700 million in revenue. So did a lot of different things there. I sold, I ran big sales teams. I helped sort of build our outside sales group. 
that called on you know Fortune 100 shippers. And then I left to help one of the founders of TQL start another company, which is now three hundred plus million dollars in revenue. Nice, Jeff. When did you start Turbo, and why did you start Turbo? It's a long story, but back in two thousand five. You know, I started looking at TQL and I started looking at the way we worked with our customers and our carriers. You know, it was very, very manual, something we'll probably talk about later on this episode. And the technology that we had was very siloed and it was centric to TQL and not necessarily built for you know, the network to work together. Even doing something as simple as creating continuous moves within our network was hard because of the unstructured data, the lack of data and being able to sort of put it together. The fact that our technology wasn't sort of up to par at the time and literally the fact that our business model didn't support it. And so I had started talking with a buddy of mine who went to Microsoft. He had some big jobs there. He was ahead of product at Bing. He was Steve Ballmer's chief of staff. He sort of wrote all of his speeches. And we started talking about how do we build something that gives organizations a common tool set to work together. And that's really why Turbo was founded was how do we give people and orgs a way to sort of work together to make it easier to do business. So Jeff, I got a quick question. So when we were prepping for this, I've always thought of Turbo, you know, generically in this, it's a TMS. And you guys said, oh no, we're not a TMS. I mean, you are a TMS, but you're more than that. So explain that real quick before we jump into the topic today. Yeah, I think the problem with TMS is most TMSs are built for one audience. And so when we looked at, when we looked at breaking down what are the elements of a TMS, And for us, we wanted to focus on what we call collaboration, which is the ability to bring in shared workflows between organizations. So we're actually solving the interaction between multiple companies working together on single shipments or single orders or inventory. And so that is what we do really, really well. Now, we replace TMS, right? If a company wants to come in and say, hey, I've got this TMS or I'm starting from scratch where Nick did, you know, they want a system of record or an operating system. A lot of times we'll be that operating system. But for the really, really big companies, like you've heard of Rider Share and Lineage, they're doing things where they're sitting Turbo on top of many systems of record and sort of being that aggregation layer and then allowing their teams to digitize the way they work with shippers and carriers and other organizations that participate in those shipments. And we'll get into this in a little bit here. But Nick, when you started your company, You wanted to go with Turbo, and we'll get into why in a minute, but you were looking for something more than a TMS. And we'll get into this in just a minute. But first, today's topic is launching a successful 3PL in the age of tech. When we were prepping for this, we were kind of talking about where we were five, 10 years ago and where some companies really still are in that I'll call the old school 3PL, old school broker that doesn't utilize technology to the same extent that, say, the leaders are now using. So, Let's talk about some of the problems with the old school. Why don't you kick this off, Nick, because you're the one who started the new school 3PL. Yeah, where do I start? (laughs) I honestly would love to almost walk you through a day in the life of an old school 3PL of what that looks like. (laughs) Go ahead. Please do. (laughs) It really starts from whether the night shift is handling issues, which every broker within the company is sick of when they walk into the office. To right when you sit down, you have to make check calls to drivers. You have to manually pick up the phone and say, for example, Hi, John, where are you located? I'm on mile marker 32. John, I have no idea where that is. I'll put you in Des Moines, (laughs) Iowa. So you put in manually in your system, Des Moines, Iowa. Really, the truck's in Omaha, Nebraska. Customer has no idea. You email the customer. That's real-time visibility, right? Yeah, that's called real-time visibility and the old broker's Let's just say the broker then emails the customer. The customer thinks the truck will be there at 4 o'clock. Truck shows up the next day at 10 a.m. Their complete supply chain is ruined. So that's about the day in the life, I would say, of a logistics broker on a repetitive scale doing that 365 days a year. So manual processes and phone calls all day. Yep. And you mentioned this idea of calling the driver. And I remember when I was at a 3PL, you know, all the dispatchers would say, oh, no, don't call our drivers, call us. And then what do you hear from all the brokers? We don't call the dispatchers. We call the driver. And I was thinking, yeah, just what we need. These guys driving around answering the phone all day while they're driving 40,000 pounds of metal, right? It's kind of a crazy model. So talk about some other things that are the norm in the old school freight brokerage model. Yeah, I would say the norm is outdated legacy systems. It's something that I would say 90% of every logistics company out there is operating on. 
inefficient tools that just create manual processes. I was doing that every day. We knew that we needed to find something better. But I mean, if you could imagine just hitting the phones all day and updating systems, I mean, that's all you're doing all day. There's no way to eliminate the manual processes. So when we were introduced to Turbo, that was the game changer for us. Yep. Jeff, when we were talking about this offline, you talked about how you interviewed new guys when you were hiring new meat for the brokerage you worked at. Yeah, I'm probably not going to say some of the things that I said to you offline. No, that's fine. One of the things we used to do in the old days was we would make interviewees make phone calls calling trucks looking for capacity for four hours to see if they could do the job. I think Nick's right in that the same things that made companies successful you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago is not going to be what makes them successful going forward. And so what happens a lot of times is when people build companies that are 3PLs, they have come from some of the traditional brokerage companies and they just try to do it better, cheaper, faster, etc. Because they want to be the one that owns the organization or makes the money. And I think someone like Transloop Nicholas has been sort of more thoughtful in his approach to say, hey, I want to step back and say, what does the industry need? He talks about technology. Most technology over time with some of these companies has been sort of bought organically. Meaning, you know, I have a TMS, now I need a visibility solution. Now I need a document solution. Yeah, integration is the key, right? It becomes this painful, you know, rinse and repeat thing that, you know, organizations have really been thoughtful about, hey, let me step back and look at what kind of experience do I want to give customers? How do I want to give a different experience to my carrier network? And how do I make it digital in a way where I can also offer this amazing service from people or digital, and it doesn't really matter. Yep. I think when we were prepping for this, you guys, we were talking about this idea that everyone says, oh, we have real-time visibility. What do you mean by real-time visibility? Real-time visibility meaning you're calling the trucks, truck driver all the time, or real-time visibility is I'm doing it with tech. And it's the same as everybody says they have technology, but there's a big difference between what we'll call the low end or entry level and, say, solutions like Turbo and others that are way out in front. And it's really, we're becoming kind of an industry of haves and haves not. That's a common theme on my podcast is there's new tech that is making some companies night and day better than their competition. What do you have to say about that, Jeff and Nick? (laughs) We talk to so many 3PLs and brokers and shippers and carriers. And I think there is a perception that if you build it and you own the technology, it's going to be the best technology and we can control our own destiny. I think... Your point is right that there are companies that have tech and you think about the digital freight broker of today or companies that have, I think the companies that have Turbo have a much bigger leg up because they're actually trying to solve more problems than just where's the truck and I can book this truck at a low market. It's how do I solve problems sort of beyond the transportation and movement of the shipment? That's where I think the industry is going and the companies that have the tech now to do that are the ones that are going to win in the future. Let me just throw in my two cents and you guys go give you some final thoughts on what I'll call the old school 3PL or broker look like. A lot of manual processes, calling the truckers directly, millions of phone calls as opposed to using technology, a lot of manual processes, meaning a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of communication going that way. I think also this is one of the things that always bugged me about those companies is the high turnover. When we're prepping for this, Nick, you mentioned how hard it is, the job. And you have enormous turnover. So you hire 10 guys and eight quit or get fired in the first, you know, six months or a year. And so you're always hiring. And that, that can't be good for the customer experience when you say, yeah, Bob left. He hates this place <laughs> and he's out the door. And now you got to talk to Jane. And I think also one of the things that means spotty customer experience because you have that high turnover and a lot of manual processes mean I can't necessarily replicate. So final thoughts on things that are kind of typical in the old school 3PL or broker. Jeff, why don't you take that? Yeah, I think, Joe, the thing you asked about earlier was just about turnover. And I think in the old models, you got to look at why people turn over in some of these organizations and why they have such high turnover. You have to look at the why. And one of the big problems that we faced in my old world was the fact that we averaged less than 1% or 2% of our customers' business. And so we weren't adding value beyond that transaction where the customer wanted to use us more than spot business. And so we had to hire a lot of people to be able to support growth for new business versus saying, hey, what do we solve for our customers? How do we do it differently? 
how do we have technology deeply rooted into their business and actually add value? And so I think the traditional broker was more about how do I get more transactions versus how do I do it differently that solves the customer's problems? And I think that the new broker is in the new 3PL is going to be much different. Nick, why don't you talk a little bit? And again, you had this traditional freight broker background. You worked at Four Kites. You got a little turned around a little bit when you were there. And then when you started Transloop, what are kind of some of the things you wanted to do different and better? We wanted to build something that was just such uh, a different aspect from what they were used to dealing with. I always had an eye, I would say, from a branding perspective of what people want to see. But we wanted to create a more modern approach. And like Jeff said, we were simply just working on spot freight, I would say 90% of our debt. We're looking for more of a long-term partnership when, when we go after shippers. What we do is when we provide the platform that we do is we allow them to be a little more sticky on the day-to-day transaction. So it allows them to want to work with us more so. So we're not just working on spot freight all day. We're looking for both contract and spot freight. So I would say we just have a much more modern approach to what we're really doing. Right. And I think, you know, given what we see in the marketplace, people are leading with tech in this business. So with all the digital freight brokers out there and all the companies that are offering tech, 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 the idea that you can say, hey, I'll just stick with what I learned many years ago, that doesn't work. Even if you went back to your old companies, those guys are upgrading their technology, I'm sure. So the idea that you could launch a business with yesterday's model, you could. I don't think you'd be nearly as successful as you guys have been. So talk about some of the other things that you, you guys feel like are different and better about the model you're using. Yeah, even going back to that approach, just because I feel like lately I've been talking to a lot of guys that are trying to come to Transloop that have started brokerages and failed, essentially. I think a lot of these people are thinking that they can just get an Algex, a McLeod, a DAT, TMS of some sort, and just pop up in a brokerage. And yeah, shippers are in need of trucks right now. But what is another brokerage going to do for a shipper? And there's a reason that I think shippers have that negative connotation toward brokers is because we're just calling them constantly for business. But essentially, Transloop is offering them a systematic approach that can actually benefit them down the line. You know, As we offer a lot of tools that eliminate the manual processes that they're dealing with on a daily basis, I think the old school model is it works from a day-to-day action point from shippers just being able to transport goods. But I think a lot of shippers are realizing that that approach is expensive and it's costing them money, especially in today's market. My feeling is when technology entered this space, that if you're a shipper, you can't take full advantage of the technology if you decide I'm not going to pick a 3PL. And when I was selling 3PL services, I used to say this to people is I don't want to save you $50 on your next load. I want to save you 10% on your logistics spend. I want to automate process. I want to eliminate two or three heads off, redeploy, whatever you want to do. The idea that, yeah, I save 50 bucks on that load. What a great business model. That doesn't work. (laughs) Leveraging a technology and a team like you've built over at Transloop, that makes sense because you say we can get better and better every single day because we have eliminated manual processes. We've got this visibility. We've got the technology that allows us to get better every week, every month. Yeah, we really say that when we're talking to shippers. You know, we truly walk the walk. We're not just telling them to send us one load and give us a trial. You know, we sit down with them, give them a pure demo of our platform. And that's when shippers are pretty mind blown. They're like, wow, here's a guy that's built a team with everyone from three to 10 years experience. You know, we're not hiring straight out of college. Granted, we will and we can. But when I can get guys that have three to 10 years experience that understand technology along with logistics, shippers understand that and want to give us a chance because they understand that for the future, we can better their supply chain, essentially. Right. Jeff, I want to get your two cents on what a new school or launching a successful 3PL in the age of tech, what are some of the things you think they need to have besides technology? Of course, you're going to say technology, but talk a little bit beyond the technology too. I think they need to be thoughtful about their business model. I think that's number one. One thing that we see is a lot of traditional brokers will build their business models and the way they charge around optimizing for that margin. And I think in the future, broker and 3PL is going to look very different. Even when, you know, in the future, when trucks drive themselves, when things are sort of automated, how are you going to build your 3PL that optimizes the interaction with the customer and the carrier? So for example, are there sort of shared incentives that you create with your customer? Are there shared incentives you create with your carrier? Are there different sort of businesses or services that you monetize 
differently than just, hey, I'm moving a shipment from point A to point B. So I think business model is critical. I think what problems you solve for the customer, it should all start there. And a lot of traditional brokerages will call on that shipping manager. And I think that's where they will lose because I think not just calling on the shipping manager, but saying, hey, how do we bring the whole team from top down to say, how do we solve your problems from a supply chain logistics perspective? And how do we do it, to your point, digitally with business model, with the right people and the right support model, onshore, nearshore, offshore? But it starts with that vision and it's about duplicating the past. Yeah, it was interesting. I had a conversation with Nick last night. I wanted to make sure I understood where he was coming at this from Transloop's perspective. And when I asked Nick, and you could expand on this, but you said, when we started, we started with customer experience. We wanted to have the perfect customer experience, and that would be enabled by tech. Talk a little bit about that. I came from one of the larger shops out there. I think we could have gone with any customer we wanted, essentially, with who we were targeting. We wanted to find customers that almost had a broken process within their supply chain. So one of our first customers, I'll never forget it, is a sausage company here in Chicago. I mean, essentially, we went on site and not only did we pretend to know what we were talking about with the Turbo technology, I mean, I was showing dock workers how to track the trucks as they're coming in to load. I was showing the board members along with the CEO and COO on how to track all their shipments in real time. I mean, we were truly trying to find customers that would be sticky to us so we could handle all inbound and outbound shipments, and not just their spot freight. Essentially, I came from a place where, again, we were taking loads, posting them, hoping a driver called in. And essentially, we're looking for much more of a modern approach here. But both ways work, obviously, especially in today's market. But we want a more sticky customer that wants to come back to us and just has a better experience all around. Right. Well, I think that's, from my perspective, the way I look at it is I use technology every day. We all do. I don't want to switch technologies. I don't want to switch companies if it makes me switch technology. If somebody says, hey, Joe, we've got this great new tool. It's just like Amazon, a great new company. I'm like, yeah, but I use Amazon. <laughs> like That's what I do. <laughs> I don't want to switch from Microsoft Outlook. I like it. So I like the idea that people will be a little stickier because they like the tech. Yeah, and I think something just to touch on real quick is we're not trying to replace a macro point of four kites. When those customers say that they work with them, we say, great. Every shipper should have a proactive solution. If a truck breaks down, they can see where that truck breaks down. And if it's been delayed, they get a ping. Essentially, we have the same thing. So if your broker partner like Transloop is operating on a system that can essentially tell us when an issue arises before it arises, I don't think there's a much better partner you can have in a logistics space. Nice, nice. Let's get some final thoughts on that from Jeff. I was listening to Nick talk about you know the way he goes to market and customer experience. And I think our customers and companies that we work with and sort of the future 3PL need to go at this of what problems are they solving? And they start there. And I think that's going to make a big impact for their customers. This idea of customer experience is not just about how do we give them real-time visibility of where their stuff is. It's also how do they automate processes using technology? How do they give their customers customer the experience as well? The idea is not just how do I solve my customers' problems, is how do I become the link or the chain that brings to life, you know, sort of a problem solving technology and then the backbone of services to the ecosystem? It's not just about, hey, this shipment here, I can see where it is, because a lot of shippers don't really care about that because there's technology that does that. It's how do I solve the stuff beyond the blue dot? And I think that's where Transloop is thinking through how do they leverage technology as well as the service engine to do that? I like it. Before we leave and wrap this topic up, when we were prepping for this, Nick, you talked a little bit about relationships with both your employees, customers, and trucking companies. Expand on that because I know that was important to you when you started your company. Yeah, I mean, being ethical is, is everything. That's kind of the reason we started this is we wanted to build a more transparent, reliable, collaborative, ethical company. And that's everything to us. You don't see drivers emailing or calling us for detention. There's detention owed. Detention is paid. We don't really play the games of negotiating nonstop for detention layover. If the drivers owed that, they're paid that. Essentially, we treat our carriers like our customers. And let's be real, every broker out there is saying that. I don't think there's a broker out there or a carrier out there that can't agree that how we treat people is shows a long way. 
we weren't all saying that so long ago. <laughs> so I think it's nice that everyone's saying it. And I hope everyone starts to walk the walk, not just talk about it. Yeah, it means a lot. I mean, the drivers have a lot of brokers to choose from right now when it goes to picking loads up there. Everywhere you go is 3 to $5 per mile. So if you work with a broker that treats you right, they're going to come back to you. So similar to a shipper, we treat the shippers right. We treat the drivers right. We want them you know, along for the ride. Yep. Guys, I want to summarize what I've heard. It's, we've kind of covered a lot of stuff, so I'll summarize it the best I can. Then we'll get some final thoughts from each one of you. So today's topic is launching a successful 3PL in the age of tech. So we look at the old school, again, what people were doing five, 10 years ago, and what some smaller brokers are probably still doing is very manual in their process. They had to make a lot of phone calls, both to win sales, but also to follow up on trucks and lots of high turnover as a result. It's just a very difficult job, not always ethical. You know, and again, it's hard to manage the customer experience. It's hard to manage it when you got that high turnover and they weren't always getting those win-win relationships that, you know, you're looking to get over at Transloop now. And if they did have technology, it's those old legacy systems that don't give you really what you're looking for. They don't provide the collaboration tools. They don't provide the real-time visibility that you need. Contrasting that, what you're trying to build over at Transloop and what companies like Turbo are trying to devote, create for 3PLs is let's eliminate those manual processes. Let's make a better customer experience from pickup to delivery. Let's have that real-time visibility. Let's build a customer experience that is very sticky. And it's sticky because the technology really enables something that's special for the customer. I'm sure I missed some things. I want to hear from you, Jeff, to finalize this. And then I want to hear from you, Nick. So Jeff, final thoughts? I think it's about going slow to go fast later on. What I mean by that is if you're really thoughtful about what's the experience going to be for your customers and carriers, what's the digital interaction going to be? How are you going to target certain shippers and try to solve the problems that they're having in a different way? And doing it more slowly in the beginning so that you can really build something different. I think longer term, you'll go faster. I think doing it sort of sloppy in a way that maybe used to be done before because you know how to sort of add a body, you know, put in a quarter, get a gumball out. I don't think that's the future. I think you're going to have to know your numbers for sure. But I think if you go slow to go fast later on, by being thoughtful, bringing tech is part of it and doing it in a way where you solve more than just the transaction, I think you're going to go a long way. We're growing quickly, but at a slower pace. And we came in this not operating on a DAT TMS or on the cloud or something like that. We came out from zero to what we are at now on a great platform. So we can operate at a slower pace Yes, we're hiring quickly. We know our numbers. We know when we need to hire someone else, etc. But we started this on a platform that essentially is going to grow with us. We're not going to have to shift over in five years and make all of our team members on the Transloop team not know what they're doing for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks until they learn the new systems. We came out of this with one of the best systems out there. So essentially, we're growing slower, but we're growing smarter for sure. I think unless you've experienced it, there's nothing quite as painful as exiting one system to go to another. At a 3PL, it's like rewiring an airplane on the way across the country. So you need easy implementation. I know that's a separate topic, but I know that's something that Turbo is pretty good at. Jeff and I could probably talk about that one for a day because if they upgraded a tool in our past at our previous company, it took the 10-year brokers there about six months to figure even out how to switch the pages. So I remember that downloading it into Excel and then uploading it to a new system. Guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. Before we end this, I want to hear what's going on over at Turbo. So over the last, I would say nine plus months, Turbo has grown significantly. We talk about this digital ecosystem, Joe, this concept of having, you know, Turbo was built more like Facebook and less like sort of a siloed system of record. And by the end of the year, we'll have over 50,000 organizations that use Turvo and they use it to work with our customers. And revenue has grown significantly as well. You just saw Ryder come out and talk about how Turvo transforms their whole organization. So in some ways, we operate as an operating system for someone like Transloop. In other ways, we might aggregate data across many different systems of record, whether it's ERPs, TMSs, WMSs, etc. We go really broad in the supply chain. We do trucking, we do warehousing, we do inventory, we do appointment scheduling, we do a whole bunch of stuff in the supply chain. But the one thing we do really well is collaboration. And it's being able to digitally transform an organization like a writer within their four walls, but also 
leveraging Turvo to digitize their ecosystems. And so I think what you're going to see, we just signed a massive partnership last night with a pretty big 3PL. Another one will announce that. We'll continue to grow and distribute you know, sort of Turvo to also the shipper community in the next 6 to 12 months. And then we're also building a bunch of carrier tools to basically be more impactful in the carrier community, whether it's helping them book digitally. We've come out with that, those products over the last month, you know, helping them get paid faster. So a bunch of things that sort of help the ecosystem and help all boats rise, not just focusing on one sort of target market. I like that you guys built this system not just for 3PLs, but also for the shippers. I think it's where the market has to go. I mean, it makes sense. And we're hearing from Nick also is that that's what makes customers sticky. They like the system and they stay. Yeah, but don't let the listeners think that getting the Turbo platform is an easy thing. I had to sell Jeff for years for us to be welcome. To <laughs> we typically don't do startups. It's just it's really hard to take the risk. But I spent a lot of time with Nick and I think his vision Part of it is you got to find the right leaders that have a vision to be digital and to be different. It's because he's from Cincinnati Connection is what it's all about. (laughs) That's that's right. He was the UC guy. The vision was key. Nick, tell us a little bit what's going on over at Transloop. How do people reach out to you? What's going on over there? Yeah, transloop.io is our site. What we're doing right now is during the pandemic, we opened a new office in River North, a large loft space to accommodate our growth. That's in Chicago? Yep, downtown and River North. You can't miss us because we actually have a billboard right next to our office, which is pretty funny for everyone that lives in the neighborhood. We kind of love it. And then, wait, what's the billboard? Maybe I'll put it out there on LinkedIn this week now that I've mentioned it. It's on our Instagram page. It says Got Freight. And then, actually, another company a block away did a Got product as well on their billboard. We're not wasting money on billboards right now. Let's just say we walked into the opportunity. So just so everyone knows that. We're not out there spending money on billboards. So yeah, we just opened a new office here in River North, a large loft space, which aligns great with our marketing and our branding. I just got back from Nashville last night. I, along with my family, are moving down to Nashville along with Chicago. But we are opening the office in Nashville. Probably January, I would say, we'll open. And then we also just popped open in Guadalajara. So we are expanding. We're growing. We're hiring. But everything we're doing is essentially because our customers and carriers want to keep doing business with us. Nice. And I don't think it's a bad idea to move from Chicago to Nashville in January. (laughs) Yeah, that's what my wife thinks as well. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time. This is a very interesting topic. Again, if you're going to be successful launching a 3PL, Obviously, it's going to involve tech. And I think it's even beyond tech, it's that customer experience. It's also building something that's different and special for customers. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much, Nick. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Nick. Good talking to you guys. Thank you. All right. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com. 